in the life of the Christian community, the priority is given to those who were eyewitnesses, meaning roughly the first generation of the followers of Jesus. It's like in many things, right? The stronger the witness is, the eyewitness, the better it is. If it's second or third hand witnessing, uh, then it's not as strong, we know that. Uh, and so in the life of the Christian community, to be an eyewitness gave you a certain priority. What's interesting is that in the development of the New Testament, we now have a better understanding that none of the gospel writers were eyewitnesses, that they really come from the second generation. They may have received, meaning they may have gotten right from an eyewitness uh, a story about Jesus or words of Jesus, but they themselves never heard Jesus speak. In fact, it even could be said of Paul. Paul did not really ever encounter the historical Jesus. He may have had visions uh, of Jesus, like the post-resurrection visions the disciples Hi, had passed. Happy Mother's Day, Nas. Children today. Oh, thank you, babe. Uh, but he never saw Jesus. Oh, uh, planting? So that as the time goes on, uh, oh, that's it good, though. becomes a challenge for the community to trust those eyewitnesses. Oh, that's good. That's why the Gospels come to be written. <laughs> that each of the communities, as the community now the has written well, on Palestine, if you will, you, beyond Jerusalem, beyond I'm good. Uh, to Rome, to, I'm at your, I'm uh, doing to online. Uh, modern day Turkey, to other places outside the Palestine. Love you. That it's much more difficult for those communities now to keep contact with Jesus uh, with the words of Jesus, with the teachings or the life of Jesus, because they are now oh, third and fourth generation uh, followers. Their faith relies upon another who relies upon another. And remember, even the gospel said that. No longer does our faith, re it was in the story of the, the woman at the well in Samaria that we heard during Lent. No longer does our faith rely on, on her testimony. We have seen for ourselves. That's always the challenge uh, in the life of the Christian community. So that by the time the gospels come to be written, uh, particularly the one that we've been hearing now, the gospel of John, that we're well into the, to the third, almost fourth generation. If the death and resurrection of Jesus comes around 33 of the common air, the gospel of John, uh, scholars uh, tell us, doesn't come to be written until about 80 or 90 AD. So we're a long way from the time of Jesus, historically, but also location-wise, geographically, we're a long way. Uh, again, we surmise that the Gospel of John is written uh, perhaps in Ephesus, uh, in the community in Ephesus, uh, in modern-day uh, Turkey. So the audience changes over that time. So perhaps something that Jesus might have said won't make sense to somebody who is not located in the original uh, geographical, historical moment of Jesus' life. It's not maybe going to make sense. And so what the gospel writer has to do is provide an interpretation, if you will, uh, for something that Jesus said. At the root of that is the, the teaching of Jesus, but he adapts it, if you will, maybe that's a better way to say it, adapts it for his community, uh, again, uh, because of the change in circumstances. And we do this with just about everything, right? Uh, we know even how our uh, democratic system is set up with the Constitution, that the framers of the Constitution realized that, uh, you know, in a hundred years, maybe they didn't think that way, but the Constitution in its original form wasn't always going to be uh, understood in the way as generations came on and so they left it open for amending the constitution as the time uh, as the times change and as the new needs and new circumstances arose so it's a similar kind of process but here the gospel today and yet last week we're back into the time of the final meal that Jesus shares with his disciples um, and in that uh, final meal two things that the other Gospels uh, also agree upon happen, or at least one thing 
uh, that all the Gospels agree upon, and that is that they shared a meal with each other. All the Gospels talk about that. John's Gospel adds to that meal story the foot washing story. Remember, that's how that after the meal, uh, he takes off his cloak and he washes his feet. And he said this to them at that time. You have to go all the way back to Palm Sunday when we read that part of the story uh, to talk about the sim symbolic meaning of the foot washing. Jesus says, as I have done to you, so must you do to each other. That's my command given to you. There's nothing in the Gospel of John that has ever used that uh, terminology before, command, except in this place. Now, again, what scholars suggest is that this whole sermon, if you will, that uh, we find in the meal story in John's Gospel that is not in any of the other Gospels is John speaking to his community with the voice of Jesus, if that makes sense. So that it's not Jesus at all, but rather uh, John, the writer of the gospel, trying to help his community, three generations or more away from Jesus, understand that they are indeed still connected to Jesus by way of his teaching. But who they are now as a community is a, uh, an enlargement, if you will, or an expansion of what that original community might have been. Remember again, historically, Jesus is speaking to Jews and in a way, his message is for Jews. But in, in the time of Paul and the next generation, it now is extended to Gentiles. So that the community of Christianity, by the time the Gospel of John is written, is a much more diverse, a much more a broader community than the original community uh, of Jesus. So he says, as it is, if you love me, meaning he's asking, John is asking is, do you love Jesus? Well, if you love Jesus, then, then it requires of you a certain response, and the response is to keep the commands of Jesus. Now, up to this point, the only command that Jesus is given is to wash each other's feet. But given where we are in the 21st century, we can look at the other Gospels, perhaps what John's community didn't have the advantage of doing. And there, remember the question that's asked? Um, in, in one uh, Gospel, it says a lawyer came and asked Jesus. In another Gospel, it says a young, rich man comes and asks Jesus. And the question is, well, what's the greatest command? And in response, Jesus turns it back on him and says, well, you know, you know the Torah. What does the Torah say are the greatest commands? Young man or the lawyer responds, love God with everything that you have. Second, love your neighbor as yourself. A quote from the book of Deuteronomy and a quote from the book of Leviticus. So in this sense, in John's gospel, keep the commands is, by the way, not to keep the Ten Commandments, because nothing is said about that, but rather to understand that if you're going to live in uh, a, this community, thinking of the Jewish community, then you're going to keep the Torah. You're going to practice Torah. That it's not just simply following rules and regulations, obeying the commands, but rather living in a certain way uh, in relationship to each other. And that's hinted at, if you love me, that talks about relationships that you live in a certain way together in community, loving God with everything that you have and then loving your neighbor uh, as yourself. As the story goes on in Luke's gospel, of course, then it uh, moves to understanding in Luke's community, again, another generation after Jesus, that that means uh, in the Samaritan story that you have to love even people who are outside of our faith tradition, outside of our our group, if you will, outside of our tribe, maybe to use a modern uh, term, that you have to be more inclusive about the way that you understand your relationship with each other, but also in the way that you understand your relationship with those outside. So for John's community, that it becomes important to know that we have to be not only uh, making sure that we're in relationship with God, well, how do we come to know God? Well, it's evident in this text that we come to know God by looking at Jesus. 
that Jesus is the expression of God or the way that we come visibly uh, to see uh, who God is. And of course, if you go back through the gospel, who God is, is somebody who, that God is one who, again, inclusively touches lepers, associates with the poor, uh, heals the blind, makes whole, you know, that, that all part of that story. So that knowing God is not an intellectual activity, but rather is the practice of life within the community. And you do it by modeling the example of Jesus. That's the best way uh, to understand it. But we know that, well, be honest, right? Is that an easy thing to do? No, it's not, is it? Uh, we might say it's easy to love God, whatever that might mean. And you see, that's our problem, right? That sometimes we do things that we think uh, is out of love for God when actually it's terribly destructive of any belief about God. Uh, but it's more challenging to think inclusively of who neighbor is going to be. That's, that's, the, that's the, the risky endeavor of Christianity, is to embrace those who maybe we don't either want to associate with, don't want to have anything in common with, and in fact might be actually enemies of the community. But we know that's what we have to do. So given the fact that that's not easy to accomplish, the text today uses a very specific, a very technical word that might get lost in the translation. The English translation uses the word advocate. Uh, well, I did a little research, and if you read uh, my thing in the Esojourner, that the actual Greek word in the text is parakletos. So not to impress you, um, I took one semester of Greek uh, and four years of Latin in high school and don't remember any of it. Uh, so you have to do some extra research to get the memory working again on it. But parakletos is two words. Para, the P-A-R-A, is the word for alongside of or beside. And kletos is the word for call. So to call beside or in some sense, to stand beside. You're called to stand beside. Um, I pushed it further because as it gets into Latin, when the translation, when Jerome translates the, uh, the Vulgate uh, from Greek and Hebrew into Latin, that the word uh, in Latin becomes advocatus. And that's where we get the English word for advocate. Well, advocatus, again, if you separate the word out, is ad, uh, for, or to, uh, vocatus, called, called to. So something about the use of the word, at least in Greek, parakletos, or Latin, advocatus, suggests that, that the, uh, the individual, if you will, is called, to stand beside, to walk with, uh, to, uh, to be engaged in such a way that that individual supports uh, another or supports the community, if you will. Uh, uh, parentheses around this, this is a sidelight uh, that, of course, this will go on and where we're headed to liturgically is the celebration of Pentecost in two weeks. And on Pentecost, it's understood that the Holy Spirit, uh, and you notice in the text it says the spirit of truth, so that somehow or another in the length of Christian history and tradition and the development of theology, that the advocate becomes the Holy Spirit. In any event, close parentheses, back to the story, right? For teachers in the, in the, in the congregation. I said that this word is a very technical, precise word because it's a word that in the audience of John's community where it's being spoken to, that they would immediately be thinking about lawyers and the judicial system. So that uh, an individual attempting to uh, take their claim to a court 
wouldn't be thought of as going alone, because that would be a disaster, uh, but you would uh, look for someone who would go with you to the court, who knew the language of the court, who knew the system of the court, who knew everything about it, so that uh, when uh, you got to the court and your opponent on the other side uh, stood up and said crazy things, that your advocate, your Paracletos, was there to immediately object and would stand up and say, that's nonsense, not that they ever say that, but you might say that from time to time. That's really nonsense, you have no proof, no evidence for that, blah, 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 right? We're just kind of inundated now with all kinds of trials and courtrooms and all that kind of stuff. So this should all be familiar as to how this operates. So in any event, the technicality, the technical nature of this word implies that to accomplish this Christian life and this Christian community, that we can't do this alone on our individual ability because there are just going to be, there are just going to be times when we're just not going to know what the heck's going on uh, or what we need to do in response to it. Uh, Carla and I were talking about the fact that uh, she said uh, and tried to open up the box uh, with the coffee creamers in it that she read the directions on how to open up the box and of course it didn't open the way that she wanted it. I told the story that I had uh, also, I usually give the directions over to Steve because I'm a visual uh, putter together and I just look at the thing and think I know what I'm doing. Um, and uh, I told uh, Carla that we were putting together a, a thing to go in our bathroom that had a glass case on the top and a cabinet on the bottom. And I had the whole thing laid out on the floor of the kitchen uh, and went to uh, attach the top to the bottom and it wouldn't attach. And I got frustrated and said a few words. And Steve, of course, comes back very uh, quietly and says, well, did you read the directions? And of course, at that point, I said, what do you think? <laughs> no, because I just figured I knew how to put it all together. He said, read the directions. Well, after a few more choice words about being told that I should do something that I didn't want to do, uh, I read the directions and found out that I had actually put the top upside down uh, and so had to dissemble the whole thing and start all over again. And by this point, it had taken three days to put this thing together when it should have only taken two hours to put together. But that's besides the point. So the thing is that sometimes we need uh, a set of uh, instructions and directions on how to, how to do this work of Jesus, how to be in community with each other, uh, because it's not always evident and it's not always going to be easy, right? Uh, that having uh, a lawyer or an advocate who will know all of those things, that that person can stand with us, stand next to us, uh, and guide us along, hopefully guide us along. Uh, and hopefully, uh, hopefully we end up uh, on the good side of things, that we have been well defended, uh, that we have uh, been able to bring forth witnesses, uh, and here, if you come think of witnesses, not just somebody who's going to sit in the witness box and uh, give either eyewitness testimony or uh, character testimony or uh, whatever it might be. Um, I'm thinking of my cousin Vinny's movie where, the, uh, where the, the lady gets on the stand and she figures out that the tire marks aren't from the car that they got a picture of. And, she sa and he says, well, what do you know about that car? And for you know, seemingly 15 minutes, she tells everything that she knows about the car. So she is a, um, what do you call, what would you? Expert witness. expert witness. She expertly can do that. So those might be for us, elders in the community that have lived this life, maybe, maybe mothers. Mothers, you, you were always, mothers, mothers in, in human history have really been the keepers of the stories. They're the ones who tell the stories. Uh, the fathers were out doing whatever they needed to do to make sure, uh, to make sure that they had food uh, for the table uh, and whatever else. 
But the mothers were the ones who were the keepers of the story, the wisdom of the community. It's interesting, right? That in the development of the Christian community, it's not the mothers who are in leadership. It's the fathers who think they know everything and don't have to read the direction and tell everybody else how they are supposed to live their lives, uh, regardless of how well they are able to keep uh, to the truth uh, and the tradition. So mothers, you were the ones who told the stories, who kept the stories, who had the wisdom necessary, right? How often would we go to our father if there was an injury that we had? Probably not very often, at least I didn't anyway. I went to my mother. Uh, and so it is through history. Uh, if you will, that there are people like our mothers who keep the tradition, who know the wisdom, uh, and who stand in a position within the community to be our advocates. And I think, I, I remember just watching yesterday, and whatever my uh, full response might be to the situation, but it was about the case that uh, uh, in our sites right now about the young man who was shot as he was fleeing uh, from the police. And there they were down at the city hall uh, protesting, maybe not many people, 10 people maybe. And who were the speakers? The mother. If you watch any of those stories about any of the shootings and any of the, of the killing, it's the mothers uh, often, not always, but often who will speak. I think of seeing the pictures of especially in war-torn places, who, who do we see more pictures of? The women, the mothers. Um, I'm, I'm saying that and you could go through any number of situations or circumstances, uh, whatever they might be, that in all those instances, mothers you are and mothers have been advocates for us. Like that story I told at the beginning. My mother said, you and, our, and my, you, your father and I will stand behind you. At that point, she was advocating for me. And that's all I needed to hear. Uh, I didn't need anything more, I just needed to know that. And I went on uh, with my life. Here I stand, obviously, uh, if it hadn't been for that moment. But think of the people in our lives. No, let's think of ourselves. That not that we are expert witnesses or eyewitnesses or uh, character witnesses, although that might always be helpful uh, for us, but whatever it might be, that we become uh, advocates for each other, for our children, advocates for our children in the way that we share our story and encourage them uh, to come to know the story, that we are advocates for uh, the homeless, that we're advocates for people, why? Because in understanding how this work of, of our lives as followers of Jesus, as disciples of Jesus goes, that it's not to get our souls saved or to get us individually to heaven. That's not what it's about. What it's about is to transform and change uh, the structures and systems of the world in which we live that oftentimes stand against the value of life and not only contradict life, but actually work to destroy, demean, degrade life. So that we have to be in a position that if we're going to hold to the commands, quote the commands, love God, love neighbor, if that's the guiding principle, you've seen it as we put it up on the, on the, on the PowerPoint to begin with that if those three facets of our life as a community are what we believe, then we have to be promoting it amongst the community. We have to be promoting it with each other. We have to be saying that we do believe, believe in extravagant welcome. And oh, by the way, it's not just a belief, but it's a practice. We do this that we follow each one of these things and that we are encouraging one another, challenging one another, advocating for one another uh, in a way uh, that uh, shows how we are interested in transforming and changing the world uh, in which we live, to make it a more just world, assuming, I guess, that it's not a just world, uh, to make it a more peaceful world, 
And all we have to do is watch the TV now, and we know that it's not a very peace-filled uh, world. So that those are the kinds of things, and it's not just the Holy Spirit sitting on our shoulder whispering into our ear what we need to do, but rather understanding, as the text today suggested, that God is in us, the example of Jesus is before us, and so that once we know this, then that gives us the strength uh, and the ability to be in a position, public position, to engage the world through the lens and vision of the reign of God. So that advocating means to be an advocate for the reign of God and to be interested in making the world more just, more peace-filled, more compassionate. I think as we go towards Pentecost again to realize that the fullness of this comes in the liturgical celebration of Pentecost, but to know that it, I think it suggests what the future is, what the future has to be, it has to be focused on advocacy for justice, advocacy for peace, advocacy for compassion. That's the future. That's what the challenge of being Christian today is all about.